my privilege to talk to you today about building blocks and foundations for what I call a smart, low-carbon power grid. Uh, let me begin by telling you a little story, and it's a story about my house. Uh, my wife and I are building a house in Little Compton, Rhode Island, and it's a green prefabricated home with super efficient walls and floors and ceilings. All of you know that, that in all energy systems and all energy policy, you begin with energy efficiency, and we were happy to do that. But in addition to that, you might call this house a little smart, low-carbon power grid on its, on its own. It's pre-wired for, for both PV and solar thermal, uh, pre-wired for electric vehicle charging. Uh, it has radiant flooring, and it has a home energy management system that does many of the control systems Roger just talked about, monitors and controls all the systems in the house. I got a call from my builder about two months ago, and he said, Peter, the, the home is coming along beautifully in the factory. All the systems are, are working together. They're, they're all going according to schedule, but we have a problem. We poured the foundation wrong on the site, and so the house won't fit on the site when we bring it over there, and if it doesn't connect to the foundation, nothing's going to work. So we're going to have to redo the foundation. I'm happy to tell you that the foundation's been redone, the house is about to be delivered. But the point of this little story is that um, the technologies and techniques and building blocks that I'm about to talk to you about rest on a, a very, very important foundation. In the electric power industry, the foundation of the industry are regulatory, institutional, business and financial models that allow the industry to move forward. And although we won't be able to talk much about them today, uh, I want you all to know that they're, they're every bit as important as the technologies and techniques we're going to talk about. Now, all of you in the energy field know that the electric power industry is going through its greatest era of transformation ever. And that's as a result of a number of change drivers that happen to be coming together right now at this moment in history. First of all, we know from our own experience now with increasingly severe weather events like Hurricane Sandy here in the US, as well as from the strong consensus of climate scientists all over the world, that climate change is real, that our climate is changing in dangerous ways, and that we have to remove greenhouse gases from our energy system urgently. That's an important imperative, and it will be with us for many years to come. Second change driver is the one Roger mentioned. It's the smart grid. Now, we often refer to the smart grid as a single technology that you can just drop in and turn the key, but really the smart grid is a huge suite of technologies and techniques uh, that involves sensing, computing, control, measurement, and analysis. All of the, the digital computing technologies that have changed so many aspects of our lives, changed so many industrial processes, it is the migration of all of those into the power sector to make the grid more controllable and to change the way customers interact with the power system. The, th the third change driver that, I'll, that I'll talk about, and, and there, are, there are some others, but the third big one is, in a sense, the reason we're here today, and that's renewable energy. Renewable energy has become dramatically cheaper, more efficient, uh, more easily installed, and more accessible all over the world. And that gives us a very, very important pathway towards a smart, low-carbon future, and it's what I want to talk to you about with respect to building blocks and, and foundations. Because of, of the confluence of these change drivers, renewable energy is becoming a dominant force in the power industry. Globally, the growth has been quite impressive. We've gone from 1% renewable energy to 2% in 2000, doubled again to 4% in 2010, and the International Energy Agency projects that fully half of all of the power investment all over the world will be renewable between now and 2035, bringing us to 15% 
renewables. In Texas, the gro your growth here has been even more rapid and impressive. You were at a half percent power generation in 1990, still a half percent in 2000. In just the space of 10 years, you've gone to 7%, 8.5% uh, today, and you're, you're on track for even greater amounts. And all over the world, we see that, that this is being replicated. Uh, we know California has a goal of 33% renewables by 2020. Uh, China, in its 11th five-year plan just released, set a goal for 20% renewables by 2020. And President Obama set a goal of 80% clean energy by 2035 in his last campaign. So we are going to see more and more renewable energy um, as, as we should entering the power grid. But that does introduce some, some challenges. Um, power grids have a very unique technical attribute, um, and that is that they require continuous balancing. At every moment, the total power supply coming from all of the power sources into the grid has to equal the sum of all of the demands from residential, commercial, industrial customers. And every moment of every day, power grid operators are at control systems making sure that this balance is maintained, primarily by turning conventional plants up and down by small amounts to balance the grid out. And as renewable energy is introduced uh, in greater and greater amounts, this adds a particular challenge. Now, before I talk about this challenge, I also want to mention some, an important foundation here. I've sort of been taking the power grid for granted. One of the <laughs> important, obvious, and essential foundations of uh, a smart low carbon grid is the grid itself. And that means that one of the foundations, which unfortunately we won't be able to talk too much about today, is uh, sound processes for, for planning grid expansions, for getting them paid for, and for regulating access and use of, of the grid. It's a whole subject unto itself, it's, and it's an essential foundation. But assuming we have that, there are some important challenges that, that we can address but that increasing renewable energy introduces. Now, many forms of renewable energy are controllable just like conventional power plants, and other forms of renewable energy are adding storage to them, including uh, solar thermal plants uh, built by Amangoa and BrightSource, just to cite two examples. But the fastest growing energy sources around the world are wind and solar photovoltaic power, and, they are, and they're intermittent. This slide shows the power output from one typical PV panel in Tucson, Arizona on, on a typical day, measured by some researchers from Carnegie Mellon University. And as you can see, and all of you know in, if, when you're coming from the industry, there's, there's no generation during the evening hours. Uh, generation rises as the, sun, as the sunny hours come on and you head to noon. And, uh, it falls as you head towards sunset, and then, of course, goes to zero in the night hours. But the important thing to notice about this is that small atmospheric disturbances and clouds, even in a relatively place like Tucson, or excuse me, a relatively sunny place like Tucson, uh, cause little uh, variations moment to moment in the solar output, and these variations can can span the entire output of the photovoltaic plant. So you have th a three kilowatt drop in as little as one minute uh, in this particular example, and that's not uncharacteristic of solar and wind installations. Now, as I mentioned, this, this presents a technical challenge to a greater use of renewable energy, but it's a challenge that we are learning how to meet, and through meeting that challenge, we are learning how to develop and deploy the building blocks for a smart low-carbon grid. There's really four approaches I want to talk to you about. Um, and the first of them is to balance this intermittency with storage. There are a variety of excellent energy storage technologies that are moving from laboratories to pilots to actual large-scale grid applications. Um, and, of course, we also continue to use hydroelectric reservoirs and, and other energy, large-scale energy storage techniques. Um, there are installations in the United States that have 36 megawatt hours of storage on them and comparable sizes in China and some other countries. 
Um, the idea is very intuitive. You just discharge the, the energy storage uh, technology in a mirror image to the intermittent output from your wind and solar plants, and um, it w works well. But this alone is not today a silver bullet because storage is still expensive. It's difficult to do at the scale we need to balance the grid. So we need to move on to other approaches and use all of them together. The second approach is to use the natural diversity of wind and solar uh, and leverage that for grid balancing. If you spread out your solar plants and wind plants over a large enough area, sooner or later you'll get to a place where the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Uh, this approach is being used to a degree in China, which you see outlined on the slide, and it's also the idea underlying the Atlantic Wind Connection, which many of you know is an uh, offshore power system stretching from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, all the way up to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, that, that would harness offshore wind along that very, very long route. Now, this is an intuitive idea and, and a good idea, but you obviously need a grid that spans a very large area that goes back to the foundation I mentioned, but it also has its own challenges. This slide shows you what two researchers from MIT call the null anti-coincidence of wind flows in the United States. Some of you in the industry have seen this. Um, the null anti-coincidence is a fancy name for the amount of wind that's blowing around the point where you are, when the wind isn't blowing where you are. And, the, and this chart, the white spaces show the lowest amount of wind diversity, or no, null anti-coincidence, followed by slightly larger amounts of purple, then into green, blue, orange, and yellow. And as the slide indicates, there's not a lot of diversity of winds, much less than you probably thought, onshore in the center of the United States. It gets a little better at the coasts, and in the United States, there's two relatively good places, along, one along the California coastline, the second off the upper New England coast. So this approach is again uh, one of the building blocks, one of the tools in the toolkit, but we, we need to look at the other approaches as well. The third approach is the one that's in, most commonly in use today, and that's to use the, those same conventional controllable power plants that grid operators have used for years to balance the grid by turning them up and down to, to offset the intermittency in wind and solar. Again, it's an intuitive idea, but um, the, to the conventional power plants were not designed to be adjusted as rapidly as they need to be to offset wind and solar intermittency. But that's changing. There's a new generation of uh, gas-fired power plants that are much more rapidly adjustable, much more nimble than conventional power plants, and these are very important building blocks to the greater integration of renewable energy. There's a number of manufacturers making them. This happens to be one of them, General Electric's Flex Efficiency Combined Cycle Plant, and this plant uh, is able to uh, increase its output or ramp more than twice as quickly as other plants of its prior generation. Um, now, at, at our consulting company, the Brattle Group, we steady the integration of renewables into the power grid. And uh, through our simulations of uh, grids with different amounts of renewables on them and uh, our reliability and economic analyses, we've learned something looking at these, and that is that uh, the integration of renewables involving these plants and all the other approaches isn't as simple as just adding a couple of these fast ramping power plants to the system. When you do the modeling, um, you, you find that you need a portfolio of resources that help the power grid adapt to larger amounts of renewables. This is a picture of some of the modeling the state of California has done to incorporate, to, to help meet its goal of 33% renewables by 2020. And we helped with this, and what we learned, and, and others researchers in this field are learning, is that you, the portfolio of resources that you need include 
some of the very fast ramping resources that I just showed you, those kinds of power plants. You also need additional spinning reserves, which are power plants essentially on standby, warmed up, ready to generate when they're needed. You need additional medium ramping resources and operating reserves. A and finally, you need a, 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 port, a, a set of better forecasting control, monitoring, situational awareness technologies that help grid oper that operators forecast renewable energy better, prepare for it, adjust their system more rapidly to accommodate different flows in different parts of the grid. All of these are essential building blocks and tools for a smart, low-carbon future. Finally, we come to the fourth approach, which is to balance the grid using the smart grid and demand response. As, as Roger's talk explained, uh, the smart grid allows a tremendous new functionality between the grid operators and the customers, the users of power, and it allows the system operators to send control signals as well as price signals to customers and even straight to devices so that those devices can adjust their use up or down um, according to the control signals or the price signals. And that means for the first time, grid operators can balance the grid not only by expanding and contracting supply, but also by um, expanding and contracting demand through demand response, dynamic pricing, and other very, very important approaches. This is the most elegant of, of the approaches we've talked about. It's being used more and more around the world, and in particular, demand response and dynamic pricing are increasing dramatically. Um, at today, only 1% of all Americans are on time-based pricing, and only 1% of that 1% are on true dynamic pricing. But in just the next few years, we will see 50% of Americans have smart meters, and at, of, of equal importance, we will move to millions and millions of customers with the options for time-based pricing. Uh, however, the overall work of evolving the grid in this direction is really in, involves many, many changes to the foundations I mentioned and is going to take many, many years, uh, decades really, to evolve the grid to be able to use this approach. And even then, this approach alone, as with all the other approaches, is not alone a silver bullet. Now, many of you have heard about microgrids. I just want to say one quick word about them. Um, here's what you need to understand about a microgrid. It's a small power grid. Um, as with all other power grids, it needs to maintain uh, its immediate balance between supply and demand. And as a result, on, on a smaller scale, you need to deploy these same building blocks, tools, foundations, technologies. You will we'll deploy a little bit more uh, of the smart grid because the microgrids are very well suited to that, a little bit less of the geographic diversity because they're not that big. But overall, um, these, are, these are a wonderful addition to the power grid, but they still need the building blocks, tools, and foundations that, uh, that we've been talking about today. So let me try and sum up what I hope we've learned. Um, there are a number of building blocks that are critical to the smart low carbon grid of the future. We need all types of renewable and low carbon generators and we need safe sources of fuel for them. We need a, a power grid, as I mentioned, that is well planned, where cost allocation and access and pricing rules are, are, are all working well and, and the grid can accommodate all forms of energy. Uh, we need fast response generators. We need improved energy storage technologies, grid oversight techniques and technologies, and all the smart grid uh, techniques that I mentioned. Uh, electric vehicles, which we haven't had a chance to talk about, I think are an important part of a low carbon future. And we also need the foundations that I mentioned. Uh, we, we need national and subnational carbon policies. We, we need a sustainable regulatory system and new business models in the utility sector. We, we need sound market and pricing structures for energy all, from the wholesale level all the way down to retail. And we, we need efficiency and renewable financing mechanisms. With, with all of those, I, I think we can accomplish the transition to a, a safe, smart, low-carbon grid on the future. But as I have been saying, 
And as I learned in Little Compton, we have great technologies and techniques at our fingertips here, but they will only work as well as the, as the foundations on which they are built. I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but I, I really appreciate your attention. I, I look forward to continuing dialogue on this and to working with all of you towards creating the safe, low-carbon grid of the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm.